Henry Jekyll's full statement of the case. This is the final chapter of uh, Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde and in it we find out exactly what has happened, uh, what's been going on and we actually have first hand from Jekyll himself an explanation as to Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde and what happened. What Dr what Hasty Lanyon couldn't tell us, what he wasn't able to tell us for it would ruin his reputation within the Victorian society Jekyll is now setting down and telling us. He's essentially risking his reputation, an incredibly interesting uh, theory because it's, it's really something that he's really fought to preserve the whole time. Jekyll's wanted to separate good and evil, um, but a bit like Satan when he, the, the fallen angel, uh, when Satan fell from heaven the reason was because he couldn't accept that he had to have good and evil within him. He couldn't accept that he wasn't God, he wasn't all powerful and all good, therefore he was cast out of heaven. And this is really like Jekyll and Hyde as well. Jekyll's trying to be all good and it's, he's trying to separate the all good side with the all bad side and it's impossible. What Stevenson's saying is that we are one, we are humanly, uh, but in our, by our very natures, we are a combination of good and evil. And that's something that Lanyon wasn't able to tell us in his letter but it's left up to Jekyll to tell us. And as I say, he's really risking his reputation. He's fought to, to maintain it the whole time. But it's almost as if here, within his death, Jekyll is resigned. And it's almost, it can be uh, read as some kind of, um, some kind of penance, some kind of admittance, some kind of uh, confession almost of his sins uh, before he tries to get into heaven. And as you can see, I've managed to get this bit back as well. I was born in the year 18- to a large fortune, endowed besides with excellent parts, inclined by nature to industry, fond of the respect of the wise and good among my fellow men, and thus, as might have been supposed, with every guarantee of an honourable and distinguished future. So basically, he grew up uh, with, with, with a lot of money, um, with a lot of money left to him, and reputation was very important for him. And indeed, the worst part of my faults was a certain impatient gaiety of disposition, such as has made the happiness of many, but such as I found it hard to reconcile with my imperious desire to carry my head high and wear a more than commonly grave countenance before the public. What he's saying is his outward reputation he was very much affected by. He had a dalliance, he had a want to explore the dark side of his soul and his being, to do things which are untoward, but he felt restrained and constricted by Victorian society. Because he had a lot of money left to him, he therefore felt that he wasn't able to explore such, um, such avenues. Hence it came about that I concealed my pleasures, that he hid his pleasures, and that when I reached years of reflection and began to look round me and take stock of my progress and position of the world, I stood already committed to a profound duplicity of me. Oops, sorry. Let's take that back. Um... Yes, so, so uh, many a man would have even blazoned such irregularities as I was guilty of, but from high views that I had set before me, I regarded and hid them with an almost morbid sense of shame. Look at the word choice of morbid here. Oh, sorry. The word choice of morbid, characterised by an abnormal and unhealthy interest in disturbing and unpleasant subjects, especially death and so on. And this idea that he's trying to tell us is that he's always been aware of it, this dark side of it, but he felt shame about it. He could never release it or set it free. It was thus rather the exacting nature of my aspirations and any particular degradation in my faults that made me what I was, and with even a deeper trench than in the majority of men, severed in me those provinces of good and ill which divide and compound man's dual nature. So he's telling us about his fascination with the dual, dual nature of man, the good and the evil. In this case, I was driven to reflect. Uh, I was driven to reflect deeply and inver uh, invertedly on that hard law of life, which lies at the root of religion and is one of the most plentiful springs of depress. He's saying the root of, the root of religion, something that he's obviously unsure of, is between uh, this battle of good and evil. 
Though so profound a double dealer, I was no, in no sense a hypocrite. Both sides of me were in dead earnest. I was no more of myself when I laid aside restraint and plunged in shame than when I laboured in the eye of day at the furtherance of knowledge or the relief of sorrow and suffering. And it chanced that the direction of my scientific studies, which led wholly towards the mystic and the transcendo, reacted and shed a strong light on this consciousness uh, and the perennial war among my members. Look at the language that he's using. It's very complex, very dry, a bit like Utterson, very convoluted, convoluted Victorian English language. It's really quite boring almost. Um, let's see how his language changes when he begins to discuss the transformation into height. With every day and from both sides of my intelligence, the moral and the intellectual, I thus grew straight steadily nearer to that truth, by whose partial discovery I had been doomed to such a dreadful shipwreck, that man is not only is not truly one, but truly two. So it's this realisation that man is not one but two. I say too because the state of my own knowledge does not pass beyond that point. Others will follow, others will outstrip me on the same lines, and I hazard the guess that man will be ultimately known for a mere polity of multifarious, incongruous and independent denizens. I, for my part, further from the nature of my life, advanced infallibly in one direction and in one direction only. I was on the moral side and in my own person, that I learned to recognise the thorough and primitive duality of man. I saw that, of the two natures that contended in the field of my consciousness, even if I could rightly be said to be either, it was only because I was radically both, and from an early date, even before the course of my scientific discoveries had begun in earnest the most naked possibility of such miracle, I had learned to dwell with pleasure, and as a, a beloved daydream, on the thought of the separation of these elements. So he's really saying here that he's, again, it's fascinated for him for, for a long, long time. He knows that it's um, not normal and he knows it's not fashionable. It's not common for scient scientists of the Victorian era to be exploring such different possibilities. And it's something that he makes clear is a battle within himself. It's something that he perhaps um, doesn't like to admit that he has such interest in, but ultimately fascinates him. And he's known for a long side that the human nature, he's, he's at least theorised for a long time that human nature has duality as a mixture of good and bad, good and evil. If each, I told myself, could be housed in separate identities, life would be relieved of all that was unbearable, the unjust might go his way, delivered from the aspirations and remorse of this more upright twin, and the just could walk steadfastly and securely on his upward path, doing the good things in which he found his pleasure, and no longer exposed to disgrace and, pen and pe uh, penitence by the hands of this extraneous evil. So he's basically saying that he could... Um, well, he's, he's being, there's ambiguity here. Jekyll's trying to justify that, you know, if, 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 if he can separate the good then, he can make all men good and that'll be wonderful and brilliant. But we also know from what he's just told us earlier on, that actually he always ex fantasised about exploring this darker side of his human spirit. So even here, Jekyll's not the most reliable narrator. Remember, he's now a dead man. He's telling, he's explaining exactly what's happened, risking his reputation. Perhaps he doesn't want to risk his reputation entirely. It wouldn't be best for Jekyll to admit that he wanted to separate his evil side, which is why here... He's implying that, you know, it's, oh, it's for the good side. Mm, debatable, Mr. Je uh, Dr. Jekyll. Very debatable. It also here can be read, if you read this as a homosexual allegory, uh, this passage in itself is quite important. This idea of exploring both sides, of uh, understandings that man is too. If you read it as a homosexual tale that Mr. Hyde's almost the gay exploration of Jekyll's inner homosexuality, uh, there's quite a few, as we'll see, there's quite a few implications that Mr. Hyde was going off and doing some uh, some, some gay acts, uh, depravity, the word choice of depravity is used, as we'll see later on. 
if you're looking to explore this, then absolutely Jekyll and Hyde can be a metaphor for the duality of the homosexual man in Victorian society. It was something which could not be outwardly expressed and shown and celebrated, but something which was a, a dark secret and kept within the inside. This, this paragraph, obviously, if you wish to use that reading, you can take a lot of quotes from. It was the curse of mankind that these incongruous faggots were thus bound together. Now, after saying that, I'm not implying that, uh, yeah, the word faggot here is uh, a bundle of sticks, basically, um, or it can be a ball, a roll of seasoned chopped liver, baked or fried, uh, or a bundle of sticks bound together. But again, the, the word choice is interesting, to say the least. Mankind that these incongruous faggots were thus bound together, that in the agonised womb of consciousness, these polar twins should be continuously struggling. How then were they diso were they uh, diso dissociated dissociated? Sorry. So he's asking, how did I do this? I was far in my reflections then, as I have said, a, a side light began to shine upon the subject from the laboratory table. I began to perceive more deeply than it has ever be yet been stated the tremendous, the tr trembling immateriality the mist-like transients of this seemingly so solid body in which we walk attired. Certain agents I found to have the power to shake and pluck back that fleshy vestment, even as a wind might toss the curtains of a pavilion. For two good reasons I will not, en for two good reasons, I will not enter deeply into this scientific branch of my confession. First, because I have been made to learn that the doom and burden, burden of our life is forever on man's shoulders, and when attempt is made to cast it off, uh, but it returns upon us with more unfamiliar and more awful pressure. Second, because as my narrative will make, alas, too evident, my discoveries were incomplete. Even then that I not only recognised my natural body from the mere aura and effulgence of certain of the powers that made up my spirit, but managed to compound a drug by which these powers should be dethroned from their supremacy, and a second form and countenance sub uh, substituted, none the less natural to me because they, were the, because they were the expression and bore the stamp of lower elements in my soul. So the reason that he's not going to go too much into it is because he's learned, learned to understand that when you, when you play with it, when you tempt the evil, it comes back worse and worse. And again, then he even admits it's an incomplete discovery. He wasn't able to completely control it. Again, an implication that man cannot control his evil side necessarily. I hesitated long before I put this theory to the test of practice. I knew well that I risked death for any drug that so potently controlled and shook the very fortress of identity might by the less scruple of an overdose or at the least inopportunity in the moment of exhibition utterly blot out that immaterial tabernacle which I took, it, took uh, to it to change. But the temptation of a discovery so singular and profound at last overcame the suggestions of alarm. I had long since prepared my tincture. I purchased at once from a firm of wholesale chemists a large quantity of a particular salt which I knew from my experiments to be the last ingredient required. And late one accursed night, I compounded the elements, watched them boil and smoke together in the glass, and when the ebullition had subsided, with a strong glow of courage, drank off the potion. So he's telling us that he managed to get these drugs, mix them together, and this specific type of salt was the final ingredient that caused it to boil, and then he drank the potion. The most rankling pang succeeded, a great pain in his, in his uh, stomach, in, in his body, a grinding in the bones, deadly nausea, and a horror of the spirit that cannot be exceeded at the hour of birth or death. Then these agonies began swiftly to subside, and I came to myself as if out of a great sickness. There was something strange in my sensations, something indescribably new, and from its very novelty, incredibly sweet. I felt younger, lighter, happier in body. Within I was conscious of a heady recklessness, a current of disordered sensual images running like a mill race in my fancy, a solution of the bonds of obligation, an unknown but not innocent freedom of the soul. I knew myself at the first breath of this new life to be more wicked, tenfold, ten times more wicked, sold a slave to my original evil, and the thought in that moment braced and delighted me like wine. 
I stretched out my hands, exulting in the freshness of these sensations, and in the act I was suddenly aware that I had, I had lost in stature that had become smaller. There was no mirror at that date in my room, for uh, that which stands beside me as I write was brought there later on and for the very purpose of these transformations. The night, however, was far gone into the morning. The morning, black as it was, was nearly ripe for the conception of the day. The inmates of my house were locked in the most rigorous hours of slumber, and I determined, flushed as I was with hope and triumph, to venture in my new shape as far as to my bedroom. So it's the middle of the night, it's nearly morning, and everybody's fast asleep in the house, all the servants and everybody else. And he wanted to go as far as his bedroom. As Mr. Hyde. He tells us, I crossed the yard, wherein the constellations looked down upon me. I could have thought with wonder the first creature of that sort that their unsleeping vigilance had yet, uh, dis had yet disclosed to them. I stole through the corridors, a stranger in my own house, and coming to my room, I saw for the first time the appearance of Edward Hyde. So he's gone across under as he looked under as he as he walked underneath the blanket of stars above him in the darkness. He believes that this is the first time that such the world has ever seen such a transformation. And it was for there for the first time he saw the appearance of Edward Hyde. He's hiding his evil side. I must here speak by theory alone, saying that uh, saying not that which I know, but that which I suppose to be most probable. The evil side of my nature, to which I had now transferred the stamping effigy, effigy, was less robust and less developed than the good which I had just deposed. Again, in the course of my life, which had been after, which had been after all, an intense a life of effort, virtue, and control, it had been much less exercised and much less exhausted. And hence, as I think, it came about that Edward Hyde was so much smaller, slighter, and younger than Henry Jekyll. This is an interesting idea. Is his evil side much smaller, therefore his evil side is smaller than his good side? Is this what Jekyll's trying to tell us, that the whole reason that Mr Hyde is so small is because that his evil side is not as developed? Well, possibly, but we also must remember that Mr Edward Hyde's strength is so much stronger than Dr Jekyll. Remember when he beat Sir Danvers Carew brutally to death. Remember, it was his strength which snapped this wooden solid stick in two. It was it was Hyde's strength. Therefore, is there an implication that actually, although he is smaller, the actual evil within him is stronger than any good he knows. Even as good shone upon the countenance of the one, evil was written broadly and plainly upon the face of the other. Evil besides, which I must still believe to be the lethal side of man, and left on that body an imprint of deformity and decay. And yet, when I looked upon that ugly idol in the glass in the mirror, I was conscious of no repugnance. He was not, he was not mortified, he was not horrified at his new evil side. He, there was no horrible for him, even though he could see it was a deformed and horrible image that stared back at him. For Jekyll himself, he was not repugnated by it. He was not that worried by it. Um, and yet, when I looked upon that ugly idol in the glass, I was conscious of no repugnance, rather a leap of welcome that he was, he was happy to see it. This too was myself. He's identifying that the evil within him is himself. He's identified the duality of man that exists of good and evil. It seemed natural and human. In my eyes, it bore a livelier image of the spirit. It seemed more expressed and single than the imperfect and divided countenance I had been hitherto, hitherto accustomed to call mine. So it seemed more natural than the, than the fake, outward, respectable reputation that he's been withholding throughout his life. And in so far I was doubtless right, I had observed that when I wore the semblance of Edward Hyde, none could come near to me at first without visible misgiving of the flesh. So he acknowledged that when people saw him, they were sickened by him. This, as I take it, uh, was because all human beings as we meet them are, co are uh, commingled out of good and evil. And Edward Hyde, alone in the ranks of mankind, was pure evil. So he was the only person in the world, in the history of mankind, to be purely evil. That is why people are so disgusted when they see Hyde's face, because they recognise the sheer evil that is within him. 
I lingered but, uh, but a moment at the mirror. The second and conclusive experiment had yet to be attempted. It yet remained to be seen if I had lost my identity beyond redemption and must flee before daylight from a house that was no longer mine. And hurrying back to my cabinet, I once more prepared and drank the cup, once more suffered the pangs of dissolution, and came to myself once more with the character, the stature and the face of Henry Jekyll. So he's gone back, taken the potion again, and he's turned back into Jekyll. That night I had come to the fatal crossroads. Had I approached my discovery in a more noble spirit, had I risked the experiment while under the empire of generous or pious aspirations, all must ha have been otherwise. And from those agonies of death and birth I have come forth an angel instead of a fiend. The drug had no discriminating action. It was neither diabolical nor divine. It but shook the doors of the prison house of my disproportion, and like the captives of Philippi, which, uh, that which stood within ran forth. And at that time my virtue slumbered, my evil kept awake my ambition, was alert and swift to seize the occasion, and the thing that projected was Edward Hyde. So what he's saying here is he understands that now he knows good and evil, he has to make a decision. And because he kind of, he's admitting here he enjoyed the evil side, the decision was he would carry on experimenting with the, with the, with the, with the split personality. Hence, although I now had two characters as well as two appearances, one was wholly evil and the other was still the old Henry Jekyll, that incongruous compound of whose reformation and improvement I had already learned to despair. The movement was thus wholly toward the worse. So what he's saying is that he's got these two appearances, one wholly evil, and the, uh, Mr. Hyde, and the other, Dr. Jekyll, his old self, the combination of good and evil. Therefore, it shows us, is this an implication that it is impossible to be truly good? Uh, it's um, fascinating that he's able to make this portion that celebrates good, that separates good and evil. However, it separates J Dr. Mr. Hyde into being completely evil. And yet the other character is Dr. Jekyll, his old self, the combination of good and evil. Why is it he's unable to create a, a potion which creates a purely good side? Surely this is what he said he wanted but in the beginning. But no, it is the wholly evil side which he separates and the other side is a combination of good and evil. Therefore, is it impossible that people are born wholly good? What implications does this therefore have upon religious people who are born to, you know, who are born to, are who profess who profess to be wholly good and live their lives well? What is this statement on religion here? Even at that time, I had not conquered my aversions to the dryness of a life of study. I would not be. I would still be merely disposed at times, and as my pleasures were, to say the least, undignified, and I was not only well known and highly considered, but growing towards the elderly man, this incoherency of my life was daily growing more unwelcome. So he's, he's admitting there, uh, my pleasures were, to say the least, undignified. That's an important quote. And again, if you're wanting to go down the gay, the gay route, that's obviously the idea of it being, it's pleasure being undignified. There's an implication there that it's homosexual activities. Um, it was on this side that my new power tempted me until I fell into slavery. This chance to finalise his game, becoming an old man, an elderly man, you know, he's getting older and older. This is the last opportunity he has to really explore this evil, dark side, perhaps his homosexual side that he wishes to explore. Certainly the evil side. This is his last opportunity. He can't because he's such a well-known man and his reputation goes before him. But he realises with his character of Mr. Hyde, he's able to try transform and explore and exploit all the evils of the dark sides of life in which he wants to without being detected. Uh, I had but to drink the cup to doff at once the body of the noted professor and to assume like a thick cloak that of Edward Hyde. I smiled at the notion. It seemed to me at the time to be humorous and I made my preparations with the most studious care. I took and furnished the house, that house in Soho, to which Hyde was tracked by the police and emerged as a housekeeper, a creature whom I knew well to be silent and unscrupulous. So he's saying here that when he, when he decided to make the split personality to explore and exploit the character of Hyde more, he bought this house in Soho, in Soho sorry, the dark 
side of London whereby prostitution and drugs and things like that and poverty are far more readily accessible and is able and also homosexuality I would dare say perhaps places for gay men to meet this would be able to be explored and he could live there and it very much is a reflection note how the setting of Soho is a reflection of the character of Hyde um, on the other side, I announced to my servants that a Mr. Hyde, whom I described, was to have full liberty. So at Dr. Jekyll's house, Hyde was to have full liberty and power about my house in the square. And to parry mishaps, I even called and made myself a familiar object to my second character. I next drew up that will to which you so much objected, so that if anything befell me in the person of Dr. Jekyll, I could enter on that of Edward Hyde without pecuniary loss. And thus fortified, as I supposed on every side, I began to profit by the strange immunities of my position. So again, he's got the will which he drew up, which said if anything happened to him, everything was to go to Mr Hyde. Men have before hired bravos to transact their crimes while their own person and reputation sat under shelter. I was the first that ever did so for his pleasures. I was the first that could plod in the public eye with a load of genial respectability and in a moment, like a schoolboy, strip off these lendings and spring headlong into the sea of liberty. But for me, in my impenetrable mantle, the safety was complete. Think of it, I did not even exist. Let me but escape into my laboratory door, give me but a second or two to mix and swallow the draught that had always standing ready, and whatever he had done, Edward Hyde would pass away like the stain of breath upon a mirror, and there in his stead, quietly at home, trimming the midnight lamp in his study, a man who could afford to laugh at suspicion would be Henry Jekyll. What he is able to do as Mr Hyde is be the horrible, evil, deceitful, terrible, evil person that he wants to be, and he will never be detected, for all he has to do is to take two seconds to mix that potion, drink it, and then become transformed back into the body of Dr Henry. Jekyll, the respectable Victorian gentleman upon whom no suspicion would ever be. The pleasures which I made haste to seek in my disguise were, as I said, undignified. Again, this word choice of un the pleasures, yeah, uh, the pleasures which he would seek as his character of Dr. Hyde were undignified. I would scarce use a harder term. He's admitting that the depravity was undignified. Again, if you wish to. Uh, make the connection to homosexual acts, this is certainly the time to. I would scarcely use a harder term, but in the hands of Edward Hyde, they soon began to turn toward the monstrous. So uh, Jekyll saying, even within my own mind, the, the, the good side of Jekyll, the Dr. Jekyll, not Mr. Hyde, the Dr. Jekyll, the combination of good and bad. Jekyll's admitting that even though his pleasures are undignified, Hyde's are monstrous. When he became the body of Mr. Hyde, he was beginning to not be able to control the desires and lusts and, and pleasures which Hyde sought for. When I would come back from these excursions, I was often plunged into a kind of wonder at my, at my vicarious depravity. Perhaps Dr. Jekyll thought about homosexual acts, but Mr. Hyde went and brutally engaged in them. He would go ahead with them. Uh, he would come back from this and actually wonder at himself. He'd be amazed at what the things, the depravity that he had, that he had uh, explored within the character of Mr. Hyde as he was Hyde. This familiar that I called out of my own soul and sent forth alone to do his good pleasure was being inherently malign and villainous. His every act and thought centred on self, drinking pleasure with bestial avidity from any degree of torture to another, relentless like a man of stone. Henry Jekyll, look at this, Henry Jekyll stood aghast before the acts of Edward Hyde, but the situation was apart from ordinary laws and insidiously relaxed the grasp of conscience. Even Dr Jekyll was shocked at the acts that Mr Hyde would, that, that he would perform within the body of Mr Hyde, but because the laws, you know, because he knew he was safe from the law, he would go along with it. And he says here, it was Hyde after all and Hyde alone that was guilty.
Jekyll, uh, well, here we go here, this line that it was Hyde and Hyde alone who was guilty. Well, no, it wasn't. Dr. Henry Jekyll consciously created this potion and consciously drank it to transform and exploit and explore the character, the evil side of Mr. Hyde. Dr. Henry Jekyll is every bit as responsible for these heinous crimes as Mr. Hyde. But even here we can see he's not taking responsibility. Henry Jekyll refuses to take absolute responsibility for the crimes of Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hyde's crimes were so shocking to the Victorian society that even Dr. Jekyll wishes not to take full responsibility. Jekyll was no worse. He woke again to his good qualities, seemingly unimpaired. He would even make haste where it was possible to undo the evil done by Hyde, and thus his conscience slumbered. So even Dr. Jekyll had even tried to repair the things, the mistakes, the evil crimes that Dr. That Mr. Hyde had taken, had, had done. Into the details of the infamy at which I thus connived, for even now I can scarce grant that I committed it. I have no design of entering. I mean but to point out the warnings and the successive steps with which my ch chastisement approached. I met with one accident which, as it brought on no consequence, I shall no more than mention. An act of cruelty to a child aroused against me the anger of a passer-by, whom I recognised the other day in the, in the person of your kinsman. What it's saying is that he's talking about the trampling of the ch of the child of the child, but it's saying as it brought no consequence, I shall no more than mention. So as there is no serious, as nothing serious happened, as, as the girl didn't end up dead or anything like that, it's not worth mentioning. Remember, child prostitution was rife. It was very, it was rampant during Victorian society, and there's an implication that this may have been a child prostitute which he trampled. Was this Mr. Hyde trampling and hurting this young girl out of a, dis a disgust at child prostitution, or had Mr. Hyde possibly been engaging in this in, with this child prostitute? Who knows? But it's saying an act of cruelty to a child arose uh, against me. Yes, yeah, so, so talking about Enfield. I recognised the other day in the person of your kinsman. The doctor and the child's family joined him. There were moments when I feared for my life, and at last, in order to pacify their too just resentment, Edward Hyde had to bring them to the door and pay them in a cheque drawn in the name of Henry Jekyll. But this danger was easily eliminated from the future by opening an account at another bank in the name of Edward Hyde himself. And when, by sloping my own hand backward, I supplied my double with a signature, I thought I sat beyond, beyond the reach of fate. What it's saying is here, obviously, when he trampled the girl, he had to go to the door and to get the money uh, under the name of Henry Jekyll. This aroused suspicion, which obviously Enfield would then tell to Utterson on their walk. From then on, what he did is he opened a bank account and put money into it under the name of Mr. Hyde. And what he did was he turned it, he sloped his handwriting, so instead of being to the right, he sloped it to the left, so that it looked like a different signature. And he thought he would be safe here. Goes on to tell us, some two months before the murder of Sir Danvers, I had been out for one of my adventures, look at the word choice, had returned at a late hour and woke the next day in bed with somewhat odd sensations. It was in vain I looked about me, in vain I saw the decent furniture and tall proportions of my room in the square, in vain that I recognised the pattern of the bed curtains and the design of the mahogany frame. Something still kept insisting that I was not where I was and I had not wakened where I seemed to be, but in my little room in Soho, where I was so accustomed to sleep in the body of Edward Hyde. I smiled to myself and in my psychological way began lazily to inquire into the element of this illusion, occasionally, even as I did so, dropping back into the comfortable morning doze. He woke up in his, in his nice house uh, in the square as Mr Hyde. He, he's, he, he was used to waking up in the Soho house in the body of Hyde, but he's now actually transformed and he's woken up in the body of Hyde when he's gone to sleep as Dr Jekyll. Uh, I was so still so engaged when, in one of my more wakeful moments, my eyes fell upon my hand. Now the hand of Henry Jekyll, as you have uh, often remarked, was professional in shape and size. It was large, firm, white and comely. But the hand which I saw now, clearly enough, in the yellow light of a mid-London mor mid morning, lying half shut on the bedclothes, was lean, corridor, knuckly, of a dusky pallor and thickly shaded with a swart growth of hair. 
it was the hand of Edward Hyde. Look at the way even this, this, this evil animalistic. Hyde described Donald as an animal quite a lot, trampling the, over the girl and so on. This is again further enhancing this idea that even his hand is leaner but and, and cordier, it's bonier, but it has it's had big knuckles and hair on it as well. I must have stared upon it for near half a minute, sunk as I was in the mere stupidity of wonder, before the terror woke up in my breast as sudden and as startling as a crash of cymbals, and bounding from my bed I rushed to the mirror. At the sight that met my eyes my blood was changed into something exquisitely thin and icy. Yes, I had gone to bed Henry Jekyll, I had awakened Edward Hyde. How is this to be explained? I asked myself, and then with another bound of terror, how is this to be remedied? It was well on in the morning, the servants were up, all my drugs were in the cabinet, a long journey down two pairs of stairs, through the back step passage, along the open court and through the autonom uh, autonom autonomical theatre, from where I was then standing horror struck. It might indeed be possible to cover my face, but of what use was that, when I was unable to conceal the alteration of my stature? And then, with an overpowering sweetness of relief, it came back upon my mind that the servants were already used to the coming and going of my second self. I had soon dressed as well as I was able in the clothes of my own size, and soon passed through the house, where Bradshaw stared and drew back at seeing Mr Hyde at such an hour and in such a strange array, and ten minutes later Dr Jekyll had returned to his own shape and he was sitting down with a darkened brow to make a feint of breakfasting. So he's saying that obviously this he was really worried. He'd, he'd gone to bed with Jekyll, woken in the body of Hyde, and he had to, uh, it was alarming. He didn't want to, to freak out his servants and so on. But as he had given them instructions to know Mr Hyde, it was a way out of it, so to speak. He goes on to tell us, Small indeed was my appetite. This inexplicable incident, this reversal of my previous ex experience, seemed like the, like, like the Babylonian finger on the wall to be spelling out the letters of my judgment, and I began to reflect more seriously than ever before on the issues and possibilities of my double existence. So it made him think deeply. That part of me which I had the power of projecting had lately been much exercised and nourished. It had seemed to me of late as though the body of Edward Hyde had grown in stature, it got bigger, and though, when I wore that form, I were conscious of a more generous tide of blood, and I began to spy a danger that, if there were much prolonged, the balance of my nature might be permanently overthrown, the power of voluntary change be forfeited, and in the character of Edward Hyde become irrevocably mine. So he's really worried that his whole being, his whole body, suddenly changes and he becomes Hyde. Hyde takes over. He's acknowledging his evil side. He's enjoying playing with his evil side and exploring it more. And this is, he's worried this is going to actually take over the, the body of Dr. Jekyll. The power of the drug had not always been equally displayed. Once, very early in my career, look at the word choice of career, it had totally failed me. Since then, I had been obliged on more than one occasion to double, and once with infinite risk of death, to treble the amount. And these rare uncertainties had cast hitherto the sole shadow of my, on, my continent, on, my, on my contentment. So he's worried about this. He's aware of it, and he's worried about it. Now, however, and in light of that morning's accident, I was led to remark that whereas in the beginning the difficulty had been to throw off the body of Jekyll, it had of late gradually but decidedly transferred into the other side, so it's now more difficult for us to throw off the body of Hyde. All things, therefore, seem to point to this, uh, that I was slowly losing hold of my original and better self and becoming slowly incorporated with my second and worse. Between these two, I now felt I had to choose. My two natures have memory in common, but all other faculties were most unequally shared between them. Jekyll, who was composite, now with the most sensitive apprehensions, now with the greedy gusto projected and shared in the pleasures and adventures of Hyde. So now Jekyll is no longer becoming so disgusted at the deprived, deprived acts that Hyde is, is exploring. He's now becoming more used to them and also uh, he's also sharing in the pleasures and adventures of Hyde. But Hyde was indifferent to Jekyll, or but remembered him as a mountain bandit remembers the cavern in which he conceals himself from the pursuit. Jekyll had more than a, more than a father's interest. 
Hyde had more of a son's indifference. So Jekyll was obviously concerned, but Hyde didn't care. To cast in my lot with Jekyll was to die to these uh, appetites, which I had long secretly indulged and of late began to pamper. To cast it in with Hyde was to die a thousand interests and aspirations, and to become at a blow and forever despised and friendless. The bargain might appear unequal, but there was still another consideration in the scales, for while Jekyll would suffer, smartly, uh, would suffer smartingly in the fires of abstinence, Hyde would, not even con uh, Hyde would be not even conscious of all that he had lost. Strange as my circumstances were, the terms of this debate are as old and commonplace as man. Much of the same inducements and alarms cast the die for any attempted and trembling sinner, and it fell out with me, as it falls with so fast a majority of my fellows, that he chose the better part and was found wanting in the strength to keep it. <coughs> so he's saying that here, that he tried to be the better person, he tried to keep this, this part, the good part of him, but inevitably the evil side took over and the want for evil took over. <laughs> yes, I preferred the elderly and discontented doctor, surrounded by friends and cherishing honest hopes, but bade a res resolute farewell to the liberty and comparative youth, the light step, leaping impulses and secret pleasures that I had enjoyed in the disguise of height. I had made this choice perhaps with some unconscious reservation, for I neither gave up the house in so Soho nor destroyed the clothes of Edward Hyde, which still lay ready in my cabinet. So although he decided to give up on Hyde and just focus on being Jekyll, he didn't get rid of the clothes and he didn't get rid of the house in Soho either, which implies and suggests that he was aware that he would one day go back into exploring the character of, uh, of Hyde. For two months, however, I was true to my determination. For two months I had led a life of some, such severity I had never before attained to, and enjoyed the compensations of an approving conscience, so he enjoyed being morally good, not having to regret what Hyde had been doing. For two months he didn't take the potion, didn't transform. But he goes on to tell us, But time began to at last obliter obliterate the freshness of my alarm. The praises of conscience began to grow into a thing of course. I began to be tortured with throes and longings as of Hyde struggling after freedom. And at last, in an hour of moral weakness, I once again compounded and swallowed the transforming draught. So, no matter how hard he tried, the want and desire to explore and exploit his evil side of Hyde has taken over. And he ended up doing it after two months. Now, obviously, this is two months when he was having the dinner parties and Utterson and uh, saw him a lot more. I do not suppose that when a drunkard reasons with himself upon his vice, he is once out of 500 times affected by the dangers that he runs through his brutish physical insensibility. Neither had I, long as I considered my position, made enough allowance for the complete moral insensibility and, in and uh, incessant readiness to evil, which were the leading characters of Edward Hyde. Yet it was by these that I was punished. My word choice, devil had long been caged. He came out roaring. I was conscious even when I took the draught of a more un unbridled, a more furious propensity to ill. It must have been this, I suppose, that stirred in my soul that tempest of impatience with which I listened to the civilities of my unhappy victim. I declare at last before God, no man morally sane could have been guilty of that crime upon so pitiful a provocation, and that I struck in no more reasonable spirit than that in which a sick child may break a plaything. So what he's saying is, again, it's not my fault, it was Mr Hyde. He's saying that after these two months, when he took the potion, Mr Hyde roared out of his body and he was evil, he was ill, he wanted revenge, he wanted to make up for the two months of goodness, of purity, he wanted to make up with absolute evil and depravity. And again, here he says... Um, I declare at last before God, before God, no man morally sane could have been guilty of that crime. Uh, again, it's not absolutely his fault, you know. He he was sick almost. He, it wasn't his fault that Hyde took over him. Again, he's not taking responsibility. Uh, but I had voluntarily stripped myself of those of all those balancing instincts by which even the worst of us continues to walk with some degree of steadiness among the te among temptations, and in my case, to be tempted, however slightly, was to fall. 
Instantly the spirit of hell awoke in me and raged. With a transport of glee, I mauled the unresisting body, tasting delight from every blow. This is him beating Dr. Uh, Sir Danvers Carew. He mauled the unresisting body, tasting delight from every blow. And it was not till weariness had begun to succeed that I was suddenly, in the top fit of my delirium, struck through the heart by a cold thrill of terror. terror. A mist dispersed, I saw my life to be the forfeit, and fled from the scene of these excesses. At once, glorying and trembling, my lust of evil gratified and stimulated, my love of life screwed to the topmost peg. So this is when he's beating it. He's absolutely loved beating up Danvers Carew, uh, but again, he doesn't go into it in too much detail. Why? Why is Stevenson not going into this detail too much? Number one, is it to really allow the reader to make up their own vivid ideas of the brutality with which, within which Hyde beat his victim? Or is it because Victorian society doesn't discuss such things? Make up your own mind. Uh, I ran to the house in Soho and, to make assurance doubly sure, destroyed my papers. Thence I set out through the lamplit streets in the same divided ecstasy of mind, gloating on my crime, light-headedly devising others in the future, and yet still hastening and still hearkening in my wake for the steps of the Avenger. Hyde had a song upon his lips as he compounded the draught, and as he drank it, pledged the old man. The pangs of transformation had not done tearing him before Henry Jekyll, with streaming tears of gratitude and remorse, so Jekyll felt bad about this, had fallen upon his knees and lifted his clasped hands to God. So, whilst Hyde delighted in this vicious and violent act of murder upon Sir Danvers Carew, Jekyll, even in this madness, the, the good side of Jekyll still realised it. And what he's saying here is he actually transformed, he awoke in the body of Henry Jekyll actually praying. Which means that Jekyll was, act, or Hyde, he actually, Jekyll actually forced Hyde almost to pray to God about this sin whilst he transformed into Jekyll. The veil of self-indulgence was rent from head to foot. I saw my life as a whole. I followed it up from the days of childhood when I had walked with my father's hand and through the self-denying toils of my professional life to arrive again and again with the same sense of unreality at the damned horrors of the evening. I could have screamed aloud. I sought with tears and prayers to smother down the crowd of hideous images and sounds with which my memory swarmed against me. And still, between the petitions, the ugly fate of my inquity stared into my soul. As the acuteness of this remorse began to die away, it was succeeded by a sense of joy. So the, the, the feeling of regret and remorse, feeling bad for the murder, gradually, or quite quickly almost, began to go away. And he began to have joy in it. The problem of my conduct was solved. Hyde was thenceforth impossible. Whether I would or not, I was now confined to the better part of my existence. And oh, how I rejoiced to think of it. With what willing humility I embraced anew the restrictions of natural life. With what sincere renunciation I locked the door by which I had so often gone and come and ground the key under my heel. So when he's managed to come back to being Dr. Jekyll, he's been so happy. He's trying to almost, again, stop the murder, he's, uh, stop the transformation and just maintain uh, to, re to, re to carry on being Dr. Henry Jekyll. The next day came the news that the murder had not been overlooked and the guilt of Hyde was patent to the world and that the victim was a man high in public estimation. He was Member of Parliament. It was not only a crime, it had been a tragic folly. I think I was glad to know it. I think I was glad to have my better impulses thus buttressed and guarded by the terrors of the scaffold. scaffold. Jekyll is now my city of refuge, but let but, uh, let but Hyde peep out an instant, and the hands of... Here we go. Uh, so, yeah, so, so he's saying here that he knows he can't be Hyde anymore. Uh, because Jekyll, because uh, Hyde's now the most wanted man for murder, the police are looking for him, he now can't transform again, so it's forcing him to, to be good. And the hands of all men to be raised to take and slay him. Uh, so all men want to kill Hyde, which would obviously then kill Jekyll as well. I resolved in my future conduct to redeem the past. I resolved my future conduct to redeem the past, and I can say with honesty, my resolve was fruitful to some good. 
You know yourself how earnestly in the last months of last year I laboured to relieve suffering. You know that much was done for others and that the days passed quickly, almost happily for myself. Nor can I truly say that I wearied of this, benef of this uh, beneficent and innocent life. I think instead that I daily enjoyed it more completely, but I was still cursed with my duality of purpose, and as the first edge of my penitence wore off, the lower side of me, so long indulged, so recently chained down, began to growl for license. Look at the word choice of growl, really helping to emphasise his animal-like uh, nature of how uh, so he's saying to us that you know even though he enjoyed being good he kind of wanted to he, he there were wants to be hide again he started to feel less bad about things as time went on but he tells us not that he dreamed of resuscitating hide the bare idea of that would startle me to frenzy no it was in my own person that i was once more tempted to try forth my conscience and it was as an ordinary secret sinner that i at last fell before the assaults of temptation there comes an end to all things. The most capacious measure is filled at last, and this brief condensation to my evil finally destroyed the balance of my soul. And yet I was not alarmed. The fall seemed natural, like a return to the old days before I had made my discovery. So he's saying that eventually he faltered and he ended up giving in. It was a fine, clear January day, wet underfoot where the frost had melted, but cloudless overhead, and the Regent's Park was full of winter chirrupings and sweet with spring odours. I sat, on the, I sat in the sun on a bench, the animal within me licking the chops of memory, the spiritual side a little drowsed, promising subsequent penitence, but not yet moved to begin. So again, he's saying that he was just sitting on a bench in the park. Uh, it was a nice day, a uh, winter day, uh, and he was thinking about his evil side. After all... I reflected, I was like my neighbours, and then I smiled, comparing myself with other men, comparing my act of goodwill with the lazy cruelty of their neglect. And at that very moment of that vainglorious thought, a qualm came over me, a horrid nausea and most deadly shuddering. These passed away and left me faint, and then, as in its turn faintness subsided, I began to be aware of a change in the temper of my thoughts, a greater boldness, a contempt of danger, a solution on the bonds of obligation. I looked down, my, clan, my clothes hung formlessly on my shrunken limbs, the hand that lay on the knee was corded and hairy. I was once more Edward Hyde. A moment before I had been of, uh, safe of all men's respect, wealthy, beloved, the cloth laying for me in the dining room at home, and now I was common quarry of mankind, hunted, houseless, unknown murder, thrall to the, gall to the gallows. <sighs> Sorry. What he's saying here is that he was sitting on the bench and all of a sudden he was thinking about this. He was thinking about his evil side. He was thinking, you know, uh, uh, how good he had been. And then the change came over, and without any drug, any solution, he turned into Edward Hyde. His clothes began, his body shrank, his head, hand turned, turned hairy. And he says, looking at this idea of reputation, he went in one moment of being safe, all men respecting him, being wealthy, being beloved, uh, and all of a sudden he was now the, the victim of mankind. Everybody wanted him. He was hunted, houseless, a known murderer and ready for, for it to be executed, sent to death as Mr. Hyde. And there we go, we see a little picture of Dr. Jekyll turning into Mr. Hyde. My reason wavered, but it did not fail me utterly. I have more than once observed that in my second character, my faculties seemed sharpened to a point and my spirits more uh, tensely elastic. Thus it came about that, where Jekyll perhaps might have succumbed, Hyde rose to the importance of the moment. My drugs were in one of the presses of my cabinet. How was I to reach them? That was a problem that, crushing my temples and my hands, I set myself to solve. The, the laboratory door I had closed. If I sought to enter to my house, my own servants would consign me to the gallows. So if he'd walked into his house as Hyde, even the servants would have called the police and had him arrested. I saw I must employ another hand, and thought of Lanyon. How was he to be reached? How persuaded? Supposing that I escaped capture in the streets, how was I to make my way into his presence? How should I, an unknown and displeasing visitor, prevail on the famous physician to rifle the study of his colleague, Dr. Jekyll? Then I remembered that, one, that, that of my original character, one part remained to me. 
I could write my own hand. He could write in his own handwriting. And once I had conceived that kindling spark, the way that I must follow became lighted up from end to end. So he's saying that, you know, how could he, how could he convince anybody to come and, and, and do it for him? Uh, he thought of Lanyon. He wanted Lanyon to go and get the potion for him. Thereupon I, um, sorry, thereupon I arranged my clothes as best I could and summoning a passing Hampson, like a, a horse-drawn uh, taxi, drove to a hotel in Portland Street, the name of which I chanced to remember. At my appearance, which I was indeed comical enough, however tragic a fate these garments covered, the driver could not conceal his mirth, so even the driver was laughing at the way he looked. I gnashed my teeth upon him with a gust of devilish fury, and the smile withered from his face, happily for him, yet more happily for myself, for in another instant I had certainly dragged him from his perch. So, <laughs> so he basically, the person, the taxi driver, the horse, the horse and carriage driver started laughing when he looked at him. What did he do? He grabbed him from his seat and obviously, well, Stevenson doesn't tell us what he do, but we agree, we, we, we can assume he trampled on him, he beat him up. At the inn, as I entered, I looked about me with a so blank a countenance as made the attendant tremble. Not a look did the exchange in my presence, but subsequently took my orders, led me to a private room and brought me with a uh, wherewithal, wherewithal to write. So he went to this hotel, Everyone is terrified of him just by looking at him. Took him to a private room and brought things to write with. Hyde, in danger of his life, was a creature new to me, sh uh, shaken with inordinate anger, strung to the pitch of murder, lusting to inflict pain. Yet the creature was astute, mastered his fury with a great effort of the will, composed the two important letters, one to Lanyon and one to Poole, and he might receive actual evidence of their being posted, send them out with direction that they should be registered. So what Hyde's managed to do is, no matter how evil and violent and vicious he is, he's managed to restrain himself in this hotel so that he can write these letters, one to Lanyon and one to Poole. Is this a suggestion that actually Dr. Henry Jekyll really is more of a part of Mr. Hyde than he would like to be? The story, or Jekyll believes through this narrative that he really, Mr. Hyde's a part of him. He's the character. Well, actually, with Hyde being able to restrain himself and not violently beat up anybody in the hotel and actually manage to write these letters quite quite safely, is this actually an understanding that Hyde, sorry, sorry, that Dr. Jekyll is now a part of Mr. Hyde? Mr. Hyde is a controlling, dominating emotion, and it's Jekyll that is the other side of Hyde, so to speak. Um, there, thenceforward, he sat all day over the fire in the private room, gnawing his nails like an animal. There he dined, sitting alone with his fears, the waiter visibly quailing before his eye. And thence, when the night was fully come, he set forth in the corner of a closed cab and was driven to and fro about the streets of the city. He, I say, I, I cannot say I. So he's again, he, I say, I cannot say I. This is... The, 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 this is Jekyll again saying, he, not I. I, Dr. Henry Jekyll, am not Mr. Hyde. Well, actually, you are Mr. Hyde. You are one and the same person. Actually, Dr. Jekyll's become a part of Mr. Hyde. But in, 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 in Dr. Jekyll's narrative, even though he is risking his reputation, he is still, still fighting for it and trying to say, he, not I. I am not Mr. Hyde. Well, you are Mr. Hyde. But even still, even in his in his admission, his confession, like his last confession towards a priest before he tries to maybe go to heaven on his deathbed, he is still not able to take full responsibility. The theme, a lack of responsibility, really per uh, permeates this whole novella. Victorian society is not able to take responsibility for the idea that it has a dark and evil side. Dr. Jekyll is not able to take responsibility for the idea that Mr. Hyde is actually him and he is Mr. Hyde. Mr. Utterson is unable to an extent the idea that uh, this could be some crazy kind of thing. He's, he's far more worried about the reputation uh, of his clients. That child of hell, look at that, if you believe that, or you can say that Jekyll, that's right, that Hyde is uh, evil personified. There's your quote there. That child of hell had nothing human, nothing lived in him but fear and hatred. 
and when at last, thinking the driver had begun to grow suspicious, he discharged the car and ventured on foot, attired in his misfitting clothes, an object marked out for observation into the midst of the nocturnal passengers. These two base passions raged within him like a tempest. He walked fast, hunted by his fears, chattering to himself, skulking through the less frequented thoroughfares, counting the minutes that still divided him from midnight. Once the woman spoke to him, offering, I think, a box of lights. He smote her in the face. He punched her hard in the face, and she ran away. So he's retired from the rooms. Obviously, the private room of the hotel where he was waiting and writing the letters has got too suspicious. The people are too suspicious of him. So he's gone about a taxi, and he's been driven around the streets for a few hours. He's now walking the streets, waiting until midnight when he can meet Dr. Lanyon. When I came to myself at Lanyon's, the horror of my old friend perhaps affected me somewhat. I do not know. It was at least but a drop in the sea to the abhorrence with which I looked back upon those hours. A change had come over me. It was no longer the fear of the gallows, the fear of being hanged. It was the horror of being hide that racked me. Is this true? How believable, how, how reliable is Dr. Jekyll here? Again, we're thinking that he's not wanting to be known as a terrible, horrible man. How bad is this? How serious does he feel bad about this? We don't know. He's not the most reliable of narrators, let's say. I received Lanyon's condemnation partly in a dream. It was partly in a dream that I came to my own house and got into bed. I slept after the protestation of the day with a stringent and profound slumber with uh, which not even the nightmares that wrung me could avail to break. I awoke in the morning shaken, weakened, but refreshed. I still hated and feared the thought of the brute that slept within me, and I had not, of course, forgotten the appalling dangers of the day before, but I was once more at home, at my own house, and close to my drugs, and gratitude for my escape shone so strong on my soul that it almost rivaled the brightness of hope. He's not even mentioned Lanyon's shock. Again, this is why I'm saying how reliable is Dr. Henry Jekyll as narrator? He's not mentioned Lanyon's shock. Remember, Lanyon, Dr. Lanyon died a few weeks after, just a few weeks after uh, Jekyll transformed in front of him, or Hyde transformed to Jekyll in front of him. And this is, this is very, very important. And again, it's revenge. Why is Jekyll doing this? It's revenge. He's, reve he's, he, he's avenging the idea that Lanyon, for so many years, laughed at Dr. Jekyll's fancies and crazy theories and ideas about transformation, he is finally able to show Lanyon that all of Lanyon's learned science and religion accounts for nothing. And that's why he's doing it. We've got to remember here, Dr. Henry Jekyll, I'm arguing, was in control of Mr. Hyde. He was in control of him to write these letters to Dr. To, to, um, Dr. Lanyon and to his servant Poole. He was in control of himself not to kill anyone in the hotel, not to kill the taxi driver, not to kill... Okay, he punched the woman, he grabbed the taxi driver, but he didn't kill anyone viciously. He was able to control himself. My argument here is that um, he's... He's, he's able to control himself and actually he made the conscious decision to go to Dr. Lanyon. Dr. Henry Jekyll wanted to shock and, and, and horrify Dr. Lanyon. Simple as that. Dr. Henry Jekyll's evil side is far longer than, is far greater than Jekyll will ever acknowledge. Um, okay, so he's taken the potion, got back home and he's gone back to Henry Jekyll. I was stepping leisurely across the court after breakfast, drinking the chill of the air with pleasure, when I was seized again with those indescribable sensations that heralded the change, and I had but the time to gather the shelter of my cabinet before I was once raging and freezing with the passions of Hyde. So a few hours later he turned back into Hyde again. It took on this occasion a double dose to recall me to myself, and alas, six hours after, as I sat looking sadly in the fire, the pangs returned and the drug had to be re administered. Six hours later he's having to take the drug again. In short, from that day forth it seemed only by a great effect as of gymnastics and only under the immediate stimulation of the drug that I was able to wear the countenance of Jekyll. By the end of it he had to be taking the drug with which to be himself, otherwise pff, he was hide. Again, the idea of drug addiction, this can be read as a great drug novel, a uh, as, as taking as, as drugs transforming and so on, these kind of quotes can obviously help you if that's your reading. 
Um, I told the hours of the day and night I would be taken with this pre premonition, premonitory shudder. Above all, if I slept or even dozed for a moment in my chair, it was always as Hyde that I awakened. So now whenever he goes to sleep as Jekyll, he wakes up as Hyde. The evil is greater. It's taken over his body completely. Under the strain of this continually impending doom and by the sleeplessness with to which I now can condemn myself so he would force himself to stay awake, I, even before, even beyond what I had thought possible to man, I became in my own person a creature eaten up and emptied by fever, languidly weak both in body and mind, and solely occupied by one thought, the horror of my other self. But when I slept, or when, uh, or, or when the virtue of the medicine wore off, I would leap almost without transition, for the pangs of transformation grew daily less marked, into the possession of a fancy brimming with images of terror, a soul broiling with causeless hatreds, and a body that seemed not strong enough to constrain the raging energies of life. The powers of Hyde seemed to have grown with the sickliness of Jekyll. And certainly the hate that now divided them was equal on each side. So he's now saying, uh, he's almost completely evil, essentially. With Jekyll, it was a thing of vital instinct. He had now seen the full deformity of that creature that shared with him uh, some of the phenomena in consciousness and was coyer with him to death. And beyond these links of community, with uh, which in themselves had made the most poignant part of his distress, he thought of Hyde for all his energy of life as of something not only hellish but inorganic. He's now realising this is unnormal, this is unnatural, this is not normal, it's not the nature of man to be exploring, exploiting, discovering and playing with this sort of thing. This was the most shocking thing, that the slime of the pit seemed to utter cries and voices, that the amorphous dust gesticulated and sinned, that for uh, that what's sorry that what was dead and had no shape should usurp the offices of life. To the horror that this is overtaking Jekyll's own life. The, the Jekyll Jekyll's a human being made from God essentially. Well, this devil is overtaking this. Therefore, it's forcing him to question religion and everything else, or it should force him to. Um, and this again. That that insurgent horror was knit to him closer than a wife, closer than an eye, lay caged in his flesh, when he heard it mutter and felt it struggle to be born, and at every hour of weakness and in the confidence of slumber prevailed against him and deposed him out of life. The hatred of Hyde for Jekyll was of a different order. His terror of the gallows of being hung drove him continually to commit temporary suicide and return to his subordinate station of a part instead of person, but he loathed the necessity. He loathed the uh, despondency into which Jekyll was now fallen, and he resented the dislike with which he, was, he himself was regained. So the two different parts of Jekyll are now completely separate from each other, and he just gusts in what Jekyll does, and uh, Hyde uses Jekyll as disguise so he can't be caught for Caduce murder. So it's really this idea here that he's, uh, he's, he, he hates the situation that he's now in, this idea that Hyde's stronger than Jekyll. He's committing temporary suicide. He's killing Hyde as much as possible by transferring back into Jekyll. Hence the uh, uh, ape-like tricks that he would uh, play me, scrawling on my own hand blessed me in the pages of my books, burning the letters and destroying the portrait of my father. And indeed, had it not been for fear of death, for his fear of death, he would have long ago have ruined himself in order to involve me in the ruin. What he's saying here is that the character of, or the, the, the personality, the, the, the embodiment of evil that is Mr. Hyde took over Jekyll so much that even in his Bible he would scroll blasphemies and praising Satan and condemning God all through, these, uh, through his own Bible. He would burn letters, destroy any links to his family, pictures of his family, his father. And he says, you know, uh, had, had by killing him, basically, Hyde would have killed himself. He would have killed Jekyll if he could have, had it not meant that he would have also killed himself. But his love of me, but his love of me is wonderful. I go further. I who sicken and freeze at the mere thought of him, when I recall the abjection and passion of this attachment, and when I know how he fears my power to cut him off by suicide, I find it in my heart to pity him. So he even feels sorry for him, you know, even though he's this terrible person and he hates how much his 
whole self and his whole person has been overtaken by Hyde. He, he feels sorry for him because he knows that ultimately Jekyll has the power. As long as uh, Jekyll is able to transform back into Jekyll and therefore kill himself, he's able to kill uh, Hyde. There's also this worry now that Dr. Jekyll is now feeling within this idea that, you know, if he's unable to transform back into Jekyll, if at one point the power of Hyde becomes too much and he's unable to therefore transform back into Jekyll, he will be caught as Mr. Hyde. He will be hanged as Mr. Hyde for the death of Sir Danvers Carew. So therefore, there's no option he's really got but possibly to kill himself. Little picture there, solely occupied by one thought, the horror of my other self. It is useless and the time awfully fails me to prolong this description. No one has ever suffered such torments. Let that suffice. Let that suffice. And yet even to these, habit brought, no, not alleviation, but a certain callousness of soul, a certain acquiescence of the despair. And my punishment might have gone on for years, but for the last calamity which has now fallen and which has finally severed me from my own face and nature. My provision of the salt, which had never been renewed since the date of first experiment, began to run low. I sent out for a fresh supply and mixed a draught the ebullition followed in the first change of colour, not the second. I drank it and it was without efficiency. You, learn from, you will learn from Poole that I have had London ransacked. It was in vain and I am now persuaded that my first supply was impure and that it was that unknown impurity which lent efficiency to, uh, eff eff uh, efficiency to the draught. So what he's saying is that when he first got the salt, he bought a big bundle of it. And it was this impurity within the salt that allowed the transformation to happen. Well, he's now running low on this salt with the impurity. He's trying to find other types of salts, but there's there's no types. He cannot find it. Therefore, this the final trick for the transformation in the potion is not happening. Therefore, he will worry that he will become Hyde. This is the reason he must finally resolve himself to get rid of Hyde. About a week passed, and I am now finding this statement under the influence of the last of my old uh, of the old powders. So he's now able to he's transform back into Doctor Jekyll using the last of these salts. He's aware he can no longer control this, and Mister Hyde will take over Doctor Jekyll completely. Um, this then is the last time, short of a miracle, that Henry Jekyll can think his own thoughts or see his own face. And now, how sadly altered, and the glass. Nor must I delay too long to bring my writing to an end, for if my narrative has hitherto escaped destruction, it has been by a combination of great prudence and great good luck. Should the throes of change take me in the act of writing it, Hyde will tear it in pieces. But if in some time, uh, but if some time shall have elapsed after I have laid it by, his wonderful selfishness and circumspection of the moment will probably save it once again from the closing, from, from the action of his ape-like sprite. What he's saying is that he hopes that he allows himself to be Jekyll for as long as he can so that he doesn't, you know, he's able to finish writing the letter under the guy, under the personality of Jekyll for he fears that if he changes into Hyde, Hyde will tear it into a million pieces at once. Uh, and indeed, and indeed, the doom that is clothing, closing on us both has already changed and crushed him. Half an hour from now, when I shall again and forever review re that hated personality, I know I shall sit shuddering and weeping in my chair, or continue with a most strained and fear-struck ecstasy of listening to pace up and down this room, my last earthly refuge, and give ear to every sound of menace. Will Hyde die upon the scaffold, or will he find courage to release himself at the last moment? God knows, I am careless. This is my last, my true hour of death, and what is to follow concerns another, another, another than myself. Here then, as I lay down the pen and proceed to seal up my confession, I bring the life of that unhappy Henry Jekyll to an end. What he's saying is that he doesn't know in these final bits, final moments of his life, he doesn't know what's going to happen. He's aware it's not just Henry Jekyll that life is uh, accounts for, it's Mr Edward Hyde as well. And he really doesn't know what is going to happen. He says here, uh, he doesn't know what will happen. Uh, he says that he knows in half an hour's time he's going to turn back into Hyde more than likely. Uh, and uh, even if he doesn't, 
he, he'll want to be Jekyll. He, sorry, even if he's Jekyll, he'll want to be Hyde. Even if he manages to change, he won't be Hyde. Regardless, this is going to happen. And it says here that he'll pace up and down, up and down the room, up and down the room. And then eventually, he knows himself, he's essentially, he must commit suicide. If he is found in the body of Dr. He Edward Hyde, he will be taken to the gallows and hanged. It will therefore, because people know the association between Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, therefore the association will be made complete, so therefore he doesn't want to allow that to happen. He knows the only way to save his reputation as best as he can is by killing himself there and, to, and killing himself under the way of Dr. De Henry Jekyll. At least then he can say that he's been a good man and he can say that uh, he tried to do the right thing. He destroyed Hyde, therefore he's not that bad a person. It's essentially what he's trying to say. Really, this novella explores the battle between good and bad. Remember, Victorian society, yes, it was very religious, but science was beginning to question religion. For the first time in hundreds of years, religion was beginning to be questioned by the further advancements in knowledge of science. Remember, Stevenson himself was, was, was a self-confessed atheist at this time. His father, his parents were very, very religious, but he himself was an atheist who did not believe in God. This novella is a study of good and evil within man, and it asks, is it able to separate it? And it concludes, no, good and evil are inherent within every man born, and the evil side is, in some men, is simply just stronger than the good side, and that's what forces them to be the way they are. Make sure you've got thorough and good notes on all the chapters up to now. Make sure you're uh, taking good quotes. Make sure you fully understand everything. And as always, make sure you're developing your analysis. You're not simply just taking my analysis and regurgitating it in an essay. You're taking my analysis and you're developing your own thinking about it. Remember, as long as you have a bit of background knowledge, you can search the internet to check the history and things like that, the Victorian society. You're free to make your own analysis. Just make sure that you back it up properly. Uh, that brings an end to The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson. I hope you've enjoyed it, the hours of listening to it, and that you have full understanding. Make sure your notes are current, up to date. And before the exam, I'd recommend going through reading the book yourself again, and also if you have time, going through these videos once again.